I'm myself in band. Test control, you are in band and go for break release. Copy, go for break release. See the 238 there, it'll follow in what's called an interval takeoff. We expect about a 10 second delay. The T38 will follow XB1 off the runway and then they'll rejoin in the air. Here we go. Boy, it just never gets old to watch this. I feel Absolutely. Like there's, there's nothing nothing quite so human as flying. Just gathering speed, going down the runway. You see rotation about 165, and we're airborne about 195 or so was the, the speed I saw. Oh, what a beautiful sound that, and beautiful view. That never gets old. It never, ever gets old. Just an absolutely beautiful airplane. Uh, physics does not let you make an ugly supersonic jet, not by any stretch, and XB-1 is just a beautiful machine. So, Nick, uh, what's going on now? Okay, so... Oh, we just saw XP-1 leave the ground, um, and XP-1 turned right. It's heading out to the east, and we're going to fly up east uh, in, and enter the uh, airspace above Edwards Air Force Base. And then we're going to fly out about 60 miles or so to the east. We'll turn west and enter again the same piece of airspace we were in on our last flight. Uh, we call it the Bell X-1 Supersonic Corridor. It's named after, of course, Chuck Yeager and his famous flight uh, conducted in 1947, which was the first ever supersonic uh, flight of any uh, manned aircraft. Uh, so we're using that airspace because that is the, the appropriate place to do supersonic testing right now. So this is coming live from the backseat of the T-38. Uh, and you can see XP-1 there. He's flying uh, an area chase, uh, and he'll get close closer as needed uh, throughout the mission. We talked about this earlier, XB-1 just frankly outperforms the T-38 in most scenarios, so when we do the supersonic dashes, I do expect the XB-1 to outrun the T-38 a little bit, um, and so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get as much imagery here as we can. Uh, talking real quick about the, the data that's on the bottom of the screen, uh, first on the left there you have flight time, and that's just six minutes since our wheels left the ground. Uh, altitude, we're still climbing, we're at 25,000 feet, uh, continuing to go up. We're at Mach 0.8, so about 80% the speed of sound. And the airspeed there is a true airspeed, so that's, there's a lot of different airspeeds that you, you talk about when you're, when you're flying an airplane. There's indicated airspeed and not equivalent airspeed, but this is true airspeed, so the actual speed that we're traversing through the atmosphere. And then on the right, we have a graphic there about our engine status. You can see all three engines are engaged in afterburner right now, uh, and that's to finish the climb. We get better climb performance up at these upper altitudes uh, with the afterburners engaged, really any altitude, but it's actually more fuel efficient to climb with afterburners when we get really high. It burns more gas, but it actually takes less time, and those two things trade out very well at the upper atmosphere. On the left, you can see an image of uh, just a moving map image of approximately where we are. We're still headed out to the east. And so we'll start to talk about that supersonic uh, run once he turns right and heads back westbound. The sonic boom. That's right. Yeah, and so today, uh, so, so exactly how these, these waves propagate is a function of the current atmosphere. What are the winds? Uh, what are the exact temperature gradients? And our, our forecast today is that... It's expected uh, because of the uh, error in the air data system once we get... Uh, once we get deep into the supersonic regime, we should see... Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. And <laughs> XB-1 is supersonic now for the fourth time. Mach now, point one six. Now, uh, what speed are we expecting Geppetto to accelerate to today, Nick? Okay, so we're, we're targeting a true Mach number of 1.14 on this dash. Now, we learned on our first supersonic, maybe gone a little fast there, but we're, we're still supersonic. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Mark. Okay, so there you have it. That was the first Schlieren pass. I'll knock it off. We slowed down, we checked the, the values, and we realized that nothing, everything stayed within limits. There was no uh, exceedance or anything like that. It was a precautionary. Hey, let's deal with this and, uh, and then move on.
Yeah, we do it every single morning as part of our daily our daily brief, and then we also do it in the control room when we're flying missions live. It's mm -hmm. it's um it's so we call it the the no vote. Everybody has a no vote when they mm -hmm. see something that needs to we need to slow down and, and take a look at. Yeah, it's absolutely fundamental to building a safe airplane. Um, and, oh, for and, sure. Yeah, and it it has given us um, the only team on the planet, the only team that has designed built and flight tested a civil supersonic jet. Of course, there's some teams that have done this in the military world, but that's very different where you're not constrained by budget. Um, and it, just recency. I mean, the, the last supersonic flight of any new clean sheet airplane in America was the F-35, and that was in 2006. 2006, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. so this really, I mean, the first supersonic of any kind in about two decades, but the first, more importantly, the first one that has been completely independently uh, funded, developed, built, and tested. That's right, yeah. You know, from, from starting the company, it took us, you know, almost 11 years uh, to, get to, to get to today. Uh, and yet, uh, knowing what we know today, I think we could have done it in half the time, probably with about a quarter of the, of the money. Uh, but that's why we did XB1. We wanted to learn those lessons um, and uh, enable... So six passes. We've broken the sound barrier six times at this point. We'll see uh, how the quality of the Shalarian images come out. Uh, I hope we get something good there. Uh, but I did get confirmation from the, the team on the ground that all three of the passes that we've done today also produced no sonic booms. Wow, that's pretty big news. You know, I'd like to say the boom heard around the world, but it's actually the boom heard not at all. Spoon boom heard by nobody, I think, which is, in this case, really good. <laughs> indeed, indeed. You know, personally, there's part of me that kind of wanted to hear a sonic boom. But actually, you know, speaking of sonic booms, I think it's kind of worth mentioning, you know, the, uh, they've, they've got this kind of reputation as being these awful boogeymen. Uh, and indeed, there was a great, you know, old episode. It's been a pleasure to play with you. I really hope you guys are successful for your future endeavors. Um, Likewise, man. It's been a pleasure having you on my wing for all these flights. You see some interchange there between the pilot and the chase. They're just congratulating each other on a flight test campaign well flown. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Oh, pr incredible professional team that does this. Uh, but yeah, you know, there's an episode of altitude. And now future generation aircraft can do something that we're not doing on XB-1 or on Overture 1, and that's called low boom or quiet boom, where the design of the aircraft gets shaped such that when that sonic boom reaches the ground, it's quiet enough that it really doesn't bother anybody. So that's something we're looking forward to delivering on uh, future aircraft beyond XB-1 and Overture 1. And there's really no reason why we couldn't design for a quiet boom. It's just there's no agreed upon standard. So what we can do right now that uh, is easy to do without any certification requirements is and Gepe so Geppetto just completed uh, the pre-landing checklist. Test control, you are go damper. Damper's coming back on. Ah, yeah. So we snuck in a, a test point there to talk about it real briefly. We did some more dampers off investigation. So here, even in the last five minutes of XB1's dampers flight test on. campaign, we just did more stability augmentation off assessment of how the airplane flies. And that's going to be very valuable data as we scale that up and apply it to the flight laws on Overture. That's right. I mean, XP-1 has manual flight controls, but it's got digital stability augmentation. We did that to take a step towards learning how to do digital flight controls. And of course, Overture is going to be a fully digital fly-by-wire system. So XB-1 is about five miles out at this point. Um, and he's lining up uh, and he's gonna get queuing again from our landing signal officer who's standing at the edge of the runway. He's gonna help guide uh, Geppetto down for landing. Contact, right down the pipe. Calm, you're slightly above glide path. You're on center line. So 1.4 final. Roger final. Let's watch XB-1's final, final landing. Path. You're on center line. You're on center line. You're on glide path. And of course, as you can see in the landing here, XP1 comes in today. Pretty high angle of attack, right? Pretty high angle of attack, right? Yeah, and that's that's why we need that uh, augmented reality computer vision system. There we go, another beautiful touchdown. Oh, we greased it. Geppetto has made this look easy every single time he's done it. What a pilot. Welcome aboard, Geppetto. It's been a pleasure working with you and the team. 